Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning, and thank you for coming to worship with us. We appreciate your presence here. So this is a morning where we've got lots of glitches. We couldn't get the candles lit, the screens out, but we're going to worship and praise God anyway, as you'll find in our scripture and, and uh, sermon today that... Um, Worshiping God can happen anywhere at any time. It's the recognition that we are in the presence of Jesus that calls us out to worship. So I invite you to please join me in a brief order of confession and forgiveness. Please stand. Blessed be the Holy Trinity. One God, full of compassion and mercy, abounding in steadfast love. Amen. Trusting God's promise of forgiveness, let us confess our sin against God and one another. Please take a moment of silent reflection. Eternal God, our Creator, in you we live and move and have our being. Look upon us, your children, the work of your hands. Forgive us all our offenses and cleanse us from proud thoughts and empty desires. By your grace, draw us near to you, our refuge and our strength. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit given to us. In the mercy of Almighty God, Christ died for us while we were still sinners, and for his sake, God forgives all our sins. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. I invite you to take this time, share the peace with one another.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, our defender, storms rage around and within us and cause us to be afraid. Rescue your people from despair. Deliver your sons and daughters from fear. And preserve us in the faith of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
A reading from 1 Kings. At Horeb, the Mount of God, Elijah came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazel as king over Aram. Also you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And you shall anoint, anoint Elijah, son of Shaphat of Abil Mohola, as a prophet in your place. Whoever escapes from the sword of Hazel, Jehu shall kill. Whoever escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall kill. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. The word of the Lord. Listen to what the Lord God is saying. For you speak peace to your faithful people and to those who turn their hearts to you. Steadfast love and faithfulness have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. The Lord will indeed grant prosperity, and our land will yield its increase. Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law, that the person who does these things w will live by them, but the righteousness that comes from faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart, so is justified, and one who confesses with the mouth, and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame, for there was no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call 
on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news, the word of the Lord. The Gospel according to Matthew, the 14th chapter. Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side of the Sea of Galilee while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but by this time the boat, battered by waves, far, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning he came walking toward them in the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart! It is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, as you see in your bulletins, we have our blessing of the backpacks. School is starting very soon. Do I have any kids here with backpacks or not? You want to come up? And also, while they're coming up, I ask all parents, caregivers, teachers, coaches, all who otherwise work in preschool, school, college, university, or other places of learning to please stand so that we might honor you as you begin the new school year. So please stand. First, a prayer for our adults. O God of wisdom, in your goodness you provide faithful parents, teachers, and mentors. We pray your blessing on all those who stand with these students. Whatever their task or role, guide them to do it in love and faithfulness to you, knowing that even the most ordinary tasks becomes extraordinary when done in your name. Amen. You may be seated. And now you guys, I'm going to say a prayer with you, and we're going to bless your backpacks so you can hold them or think about them as we're praying. God of all knowledge and wisdom, these students and backpacks remind us that a new school year is beginning. We pray your blessing on these backpacks and all these students, young and old. Help them discover and develop the gifts you have given them, and as they grow in knowledge, help them also to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys are blessed to be a blessing. Go out and bless others. Have a seat.
Since June, I have been doing a sermon series on Romans. And as I looked at Romans 10 again and again, it was Matthew 14 that kept insisting on being spoken today. So, we're going to focus on our today's gospel. So here we go. Imagine this. It's 3 a.m., your kids are sound asleep, all is well with the world, and the phone is ringing. And you experience that sinking feeling, you know, the one that goes from your chest all the way down to your stomach. Because you know it can't be good news when the phone rings at 3 a.m. So who's going to answer the phone? The 3 a.m. phone call, some of you may remember this, quickly became part of the lexicon of the 2008 presidential elections. Maybe remember these commercials. Hillary Clinton started an ad asking, who do you want answering the phone in the White House at 3 a.m.? Now, this commercial was spoofed a million ways. I believe you can still find some of them on YouTube, and Saturday Night Live probably did one of the best. But that fundamental experience of fear and, dr and dread and doubt and anticipation is a universal, relevant experience. In the Gospel this morning, it says that Jesus walked on the sea to meet the disciples during the fourth watch. Now, the fourth watch was that time between 3 and 6 a.m. And like today, nothing really good usually happens at that time. So it's no surprise, maybe, that they were suspicious of this blob walking toward them, thinking it a ghost, a phantom. But God has a way of turning things inside out and upside down, of making the good, the bad, the ugly into something beautiful. And so it is with this fourth watch experience. The beginning of chapter 14, if you were here last Sunday, you may remember this, but we'll give a review. In the beginning of chapter 14, the news is shared of the death of John the Baptist. He's been beheaded. And Jesus is grieving. He is deeply deeply grieving and overwrought, and he wants to go to a deserted, quiet place so he can pray and be with his sadness. And so he crosses the Sea of Galilee to this wilderness, to this lonely place where he can grieve and pray alone. Only when he gets there, there is a crowd waiting for him, ten to 15,000 people who have also crossed to this deserted place following him, gathering on the hillside. So Jesus has compassion for them, and he delays his respite in order to provide them with healing and teaching. And then they become hungry, and so he makes from a little enough Two fish and five loaves are shared, and a multiple supply is provided. Just as the meager meal that we share on our worship times, this bread and wine feeds our spiritual being, sustains us with forgiveness and reconciliation. Well, finally... The crowds are sent away. Of course, this is only after they try to forcefully crown Jesus as the king. But he won't have any of that because this is a foreshadowing of what is to come, but Jesus will reveal himself in his own time, and he will not be forced into that revelation. And so he sends the crowd home, and 
knows eventually we will learn he is a different kind of king. But now the crowds are gone. Jesus sends the disciples across the Sea of Galilee in a boat, presumably planning to join them later. Finally, he has time to pray, to be alone, to process his grief and his loss. But all is not calm. The unpredictable Sea of Galilee has a squall wind coming in, rocking the boat, disturbing the sea, and the disciples are panicked. It's 3 a.m., and Jesus sees their trouble, and he walks out toward them on the sea. In verse 26, the disciples cry out, It's a ghost! When they see Jesus walking toward them on the water, he would appear to them first like a dark moving speck and then kind of have a shadowy human figure. So it's easy to see how they would mistake him for something quite strange, a spirit, something too astonishing to be real. But Jesus calls out to him that he's not a ghost, he's not a phantom. He says, take courage. I am, fear not. So it's 3 a.m. The sea is torturing the boat. The disciples now know that Jesus is not a ghost, and this is good news. But there's more. For the sake of good English, most of our Amer uh, English Bibles translate verse 27 into something like, It is I. I am here. It's me. But the Greek is ego and me, which means I am. He said, I am. And that means something. See, Moses way back, when he was confronted with the burning bush, asked God, what is your name? And God says, I am. Yahweh, the great I am. So now Jesus is saying what the crowd tried to force him to say, that he was a king, that he was God himself, but he says it in this time when his disciples need courage to not be afraid. He demonstrates his power over forces of nature and his power uh, to be the same power as God's power. Therefore, don't be afraid. I am is with you. I am is with you. The story is very heavily symbolic. There's a lot of symbols in it. And we don't always catch it. Because a lot of it is cultural, and, and you, you, you may not recognize that today. But it would have been recognized to the audience listening to Matthew's gospel the first time. See, the boat is a metaphorical symbol of the church. This message is written to the church around 80, 85 AD, and the world would have seemed a torturous and lost place to the church. Jerusalem had been destroyed in 70 AD, and this left the church small, fragile, They felt adrift in waters of chaos, as if the church was sailing against the wind. Where do the faithful row their boat? Are we in the middle of a tumultuous sea of disconnection and fragility, clinging to faith yet exhausted by fear even today? 
What do we do when Jesus comes? Do we get out of the boat? Maybe not. I'm going to give a little twist to this story. See, most pastors talk about Peter. Peter getting out of the boat, walking on the water toward Jesus, then being overcome by fear, sinking, and as a kind of a example of failure for not having enough faith, but we can do better. That's one of the sermons given for this text. And I don't dismiss the need for courage and faith and boldness to do great things in Christ, but... I question why Jesus said to Peter, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? What was the doubt about? Was he referring to a moment of simple logic when the wind was blowing so hard it was knocking him off balance, bringing him down to that old sinking feeling we know so well as human beings? Or was he referring to a different kind of doubt? See, on several occasions, Matthew refers to people of little faith. It's usually the disciples when they don't quite get a lesson or they fail to cure people of demons. To be of little faith is really to be among the disciples, struggling and asking questions and misunderstanding and fearing and starting all over and just being human and it also means that you are within a circle of those who have at least glimpsed Jesus and who Jesus is. So when Jesus is walking towards the boat to presumably get into it, Peter intervenes. He interrupts him before he can get there. And Peter says, Lord, if it is you then command me to come to you on the water. Come, Jesus replies. And then Peter sinks and asks for help. Jesus saves him. But he does not ask why Peter was afraid. He asks, why did you doubt? And that particular word for doubt, the Greek word that's used in that sentence is only used twice in the entire Bible. There's a different word used for doubt in the rest, because this is a different kind of doubt. This isn't the doubt that comes from fear. This is the doubt that's more rational. It's a logical doubt. It's a doubt of who Jesus is. And the two times it's used is only in the book of Matthew. It's in this sentence. And then in Matthew 28, the end of the gospel, when Jesus has appears to his disciples following his resurrection, and it says they worshipped him, but some doubted. In both of these places, doubt and worship are occurring simultaneously. And in the midst of this doubt of who Jesus is, they are also being called, being commissioned, and asked to reveal him to all the world, even in their doubt. So how exactly did Peter doubt? Here's where why did you doubt is being asked, not the sinking, back up. It's when he's in the boat. Peter says a really big if. If it is you then command me to come to you. If is a very big smack of doubt. It's the need to test something out. The word if occurs when Jesus began his ministry in his hometown, when he was in the wilderness with the devil, and near the end of Matthew. If you are the Son of God, come down from that cross. And just as Jesus declares, I am, Peter basically responds by saying, well, if that's true, then make me do something really big like walking on water to prove it. 
And when Peter fails, Jesus chides him by asking, Peter, what are you doing outside of the boat in the first place? See, sometimes it's enough to be in the boat. We don't think much about those 11 disciples in the boat. Remember, the boat is a symbol of the church. What about those who continue to pull the oars against the wind, who sat in the dark with Jesus and a soaking Peter, feeling moved to worship and praise him? There's something to be said for believing the words, Take courage, I am. Fear not. I think the preacher Barbara Brown Taylor says it best, and I will share what she says about this story. If there is a miracle worth savoring in this story, then it's maybe not that Jesus could walk on water. After all, Jesus is God, and his ability to walk on water is no more surprising than our ability to walk up a staircase. And the miracle is not that Peter could do the same trick for a very moment or two. No, the miracle is that when all was said and done, while the soggy, chagrined Peter sputtered seawater out of his lungs, and as the boat continued to bob around in the dead of a rather dark night, Somehow in the midst of those humble surroundings way out in the middle of nowhere, the disciples realized that no one less than God's own son was sitting right there with them. So they worshipped him, and they believed. Having courage to be a visionary, willing to step out of the boat and walk on water is amazing and wonderful and needed by the church. But there are times when life in the boat is worthy of recognition. Those who have kept pulling the oars against the wind, believing that Jesus is near and pressing on in their faith as bearers of humble courage. So maybe you hear God's still, small voice in this ordinary surrounding, serving God by doing nothing extraordinary but profoundly ordinary. This is faith. The faith that keeps us from sinking and helps in time of troubles. So, again, I invite you to consider this. It's 3 a.m. Your kids are sound asleep. All is well with the world, and the phone is ringing. And you experience that sinking feeling from your chest to your stomach, and you pause a moment, and you remember the words, Take courage. I am. Fear not. Take courage. I am. Fear not. And now, answer the phone. Amen.
Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Generous, compassionate God, we gather before you to pray for the church, the world, and all in need. O God, our ruler, continue to send out your church on earth to be the light and salt to the world. Keep giving us the heart to do your work. Lord, in your mercy. O God, our creator, you quiet the seas and silence the wind. Restore your creation to the perfection and beauty you spoke into being. Lord, in your mercy. O God, our Redeemer, inspire leaders with righteousness that comes from faith so that your justice thrives throughout the world. Lord, in your mercy. O God, our Sustainer, Comfort those who are lonely, feel fearful, or burdened by doubt. Give meaningful work to those who seek employment. Walk with those who are grieving or ill, and with all who face the last days of their lives. Be with especially Linda Binder, Ron Fells, and June Danka. Lord, in your mercy... God, our encourager, empower this assembly to boldly proclaim and live out your love to all who long to hear a word of hope and kindness. Equip us to use our hands, feet, voices, and minds to share the bounty you have given us. Lord, in your mercy. God, our Savior, We rejoice in the example of saints who have gone before us, especially the nurses Florence Nightingale and Clara Moss, renewers of society, until we join them around your throne. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands we place all our prayers, spoken and unspoken, trusting in the mercy of Christ Jesus. Amen. You may be seated for this time of giving.
merciful God, you open wide your hand and satisfy the need of every living thing. You have set this feast before us. Open our hands to receive it. Open our hearts to embrace it. Open our lives to live it. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection, Open to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. We hold Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, you have brought us this far along the way. In times of bitterness, you did not abandon us, but guided us into the path of love and light. In every age, you sent prophets to make known your loving will for all humanity. The cry of the poor has become your own cry. Our hunger and thirst for justice is your own desire. In the fullness of time, you sent your chosen servant to preach good news to the afflicted, to break bread with the outcast and despised, and to ransom those in bondage to prejudice and sin. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, blessed it, and gave it to all to drink, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the new covenant of my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. So remembering, therefore, his death and resurrection, we await the day when Jesus shall return to free all the earth from the bonds of slavery and death. Come, Lord Jesus, and let your church say, Amen. And send your Holy Spirit, our advocate, to fill our hearts with all of all who share the bread and cup with courage and wisdom to pursue love and justice in all the world. Come, spirit of freedom, and let your church say amen. And join our prayers and praises with the prophets and martyrs of every age, that rejoicing in the hope of resurrection we might live in the freedom of hope of your Son. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. 
Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The meal is prepared. All are welcome to participate in this meal of forgiveness and reconciliation. The ushers will let you know when to come forward. You may stand or kneel along the railings. Today we are communing by intinction, so when you receive the bread, don't eat it yet. Hold on to it. The cup will come. You may dip it in either the red liquid, which is wine, or the white liquid, which is grape juice, and there are gluten-free elements available. Just let your server know. Come let us eat.
please stand, receive the communion blessing. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you always in his grace. Amen. Jesus Christ, host of this meal, you have given us not only this bread and cup, but your very self, that we may feast on your great love. Filled again by these signs of your grace, may we hunger for your reign of justice, may we thirst for your way of peace, for you are Lord forevermore. Amen. You may be seated. Announcements this morning, most of those you can find in the messenger, but Chris has one. Do you want to share yours right now, or you might? Well, while she's getting the mic, grief share begins tomorrow night, so if you have experienced a loss in your life, a death in your family, or a loved one, or a friend, uh, this is a um, support group for grief. It's a 13-week course, and uh, you can just show up and um, be a part of that. And also, between services today, there will be a discussion about Stephen's ministry, a video uh, telling more about what it means to be a caregiver or a care receiver. And so if you're wanting to know what the Stephen's ministry thing is about, I encourage you to attend that. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, these are the special eclipse viewing glasses that Thriver Financial has provided uh, so that Cross Lines can locally uh, sell these and raise money locally uh, in line with the eclipse that is happening next Monday. So for a donation of $5 or more, if you'd like, or five cans of uh, canned goods, you can get your own uh, special viewing glasses, and they are certified. I heard them a lot of talk um, lately about if they meet certifications, and these do. So um, help a good cause, cross lines, and uh, protect yourself and get to do the eclipse next Monday. There's also going to be a viewing party at cross lines. Next Monday starting at 11.30. So I have a limited number of these. They're going very fast. I'm going to try and get some more this week. So if I'm not able to help you this week, I should have more next. This is Friday and Sunday, I think, for announcements. I just want to share with everybody, uh, especially you ladies, if you have a couple of hours tomorrow between 10 and noon, um, we have a $250 grant, which I spent Friday, and we got two bolts of um, warm batting for the Lutheran Woman Week quilts, and we're going to be cutting the batting and tying quilts. So if anyone could come, um, you have all pictures, I understand, in private magazines. So uh, the article's already been written, so I invite all of you to come. We have t-shirts to take home, and um, we'd love to see you there. All right. Well, it's quite the morning of announcements. <laughs>
So I invite you to please stand and receive the benediction. We're about to sing my absolute favorite hymn in the world, so I want to get to it. So please receive this blessing. May the power of God strengthen you in your life. And may the love of Jesus Christ heal you in your woundedness. And may the wisdom of the Holy Spirit guide you day by day, and forever and ever. Amen. Guided by the gospel, we go in peace, serve the Lord.